Welcome to the very first episode of the L10 Machine Technical Series. I'm Eric and today I'm going over the very best consumer tools on the market for completing your 1911 style 80% frame. These tools are the matrix rail cutting fixture and also the matrix hole drilling fixture. Here's what's included. The rail cutting car, the rail cutting handle, I opted to use a drill instead of the handle which I'll show later, fasteners for securing your frame to the car, the matrix hole drilling jig, and included with the jig are proper drill bits and guides for drilling your hammer and sear pin holes. As an option, you can order shims used for 2011 style frames, but based on my testing, I don't think these are necessary. Before you can start using your matrix rail cutting fixture, you'll need to install the hand crank. This simply threads onto the lead screw of the car. As an option, you can secure the car to a vise and use a 3 8 inch driver attached to your drill. And in my experience, this makes the cuts on each pass smoother. Turning the lead screw clockwise pulls the frames toward the handle side, which is the direction used for cutting. Turning the lead screw counterclockwise pushes the frame away from the handle, which you'll do after each cutting pass. For initial setup, you will need to loosen the Allen keys, which are securely fastening the carbide cutters using the included Allen keys. The carbide cutters we are using measure in at 117 thick. Once the Allen screws are loose, back off each of the two knobs to index the cutter position. Use your fingers to push the cutters outwards so they are not sticking into the bottommost slot where the matrix logo is engraved. This will allow us to install our frame with the cutters backed off. Here are some of the measuring tools I recommend using for getting an excellent slide to frame fit. You'll need a good set of calipers at a minimum, and a micrometer if available. Also helpful are a set of gauge blocks and gauge pins. You'll need a rail micrometer for measuring the slide rail thickness. Like all measuring tools, you need to double check your rail micrometer for zero. For this job, I like to find the largest gauge block that will fit into the rail micrometer after measuring the slide. I found that a 116 was extremely tight in the mic and a 115 slid in with very little clearance. A 117 would not even enter the micrometer. There is a difference of about two and a half thousandths reading between using my uncalibrated rail micrometer and a gauge block reading. This shows the importance of knowing the calibration of your measuring tools. Make sure to take several measurements of the slide to get a good average across the entire length. For measuring the rail slot in the slide, I like to use gauge pins. This number should typically vary between 98 and 101 thousandths. In my experience, and as this slide shows, this usually comes out to 99 thousandths. Before you start cutting, you should take detailed measurements of your frame and slide. There is no better way to record these measurements than using a slide to frame fit mapping document. This document covers all of the essential interfaces between a slide and frame. While the amount of desirable clearance is up for debate, you can obtain a very accurate pistol by fitting point A with minimal clearance, leaving 2000s clearance everywhere else. One thing to note is the 1911 slide has two possible surfaces to ride on a 1911 frame. The first, being preferable, is the very bottom of measurement D at the slide, the slide rail. The second possible surface is the top of measurement C, or the frame deck. When planning to fit your slide and frame, I recommend 2000s clearance between the frame and slide at C and D for reliability, with the slide riding the frame at the bottom of the slide rail. I started recording measurements by using calipers to take a measurement at A, shown in red, which measures the width of the slide groove and the width of the frame rails. Since it's easier to cut the frame to match the slide, in this example the frame rails would be taken down to 0.7535 wide from their 0.7605 measurement to match the slide. The second measurement, B, shown in blue, measures the width between the slide rails. Using calipers I measured 0.630. This number is very important for using the matrix slide cutting jig because it tells us how far we need to advance the carbide cutters in the very end. I'm targeting 2000s clearance at this point and have 0.628 for my frame dimension. Measurement C on the slide side came in at 0.099, which was measured earlier using a few gauge pins. I wrote 0.098 for the frame even though it has not been cut yet. I'll explain this in more detail soon and cover why by design our double stack 1911 80% frames typically do not need to be decked, and if they do, it should only be by a few thousandths. Measurement D was the very first measurement shown, 
and was taken using the rail micrometer and gauge blocks. At this time, I'd like to summarize the dimensions we are transferring to our frame. Using the matrix rail cutter on two test frames, I ended up with a top rail thickness of 98 thousandths. This measurement was confirmed as typical by David, the owner of Matrix Precision. We need to cut the frame rail depth to a minimum of 0.630 for a net fit to the slide. Since we want a little clearance here, I'm subtracting 2 thousandths from this number for a target of 0.628. In order to reliably hit 0.628 by manually indexing the cutters on the matrix rail cutter, I want to show you how to obtain two measuring points you can use while in progress. The very back of the frame has a slot going vertically through the frame rails as clearance for the hammer. We can use this to our advantage by taking two measurements, one in between the left side of the frame and the hammer slot, and the second on the right side of the frame and the hammer slot. My measurements gave me 0.223 at this area. Now the question is, what should our target final depth of cut be for our frame rail to give us a 0.628 frame groove width? First, let's figure out how much material will be removed from both frame grooves combined. We start with a frame rail width of 0 0.7605 and we are targeting 0 0.630 measured from the slide and an additional 2 thousandths for clearance. This gives us 0.1285 total removed from the frame. Since we want to know how much per side needs to be removed, we simply divide that number by 2. I end up with about 64 thousandths here. Knowing 64 thousandths needs to be cut off from each side, you can simply subtract our 64 thousandths final depth of cut from our starting 0.223 frame rail to hammer slot width. My result is 0.159, which will be my targeted final thickness between the frame rail groove and hammer slot. You're going to want to repeat this process for both sides of the frame since they may not be symmetrical. Now let's do some more calculations to check vertical alignment in the matrix rail cutter to see if we need any shims. The shims are small strips of spring steel that go in between the frame and the matrix car, effectively making the frame sit higher in the car itself. The matrix rail cutter by design should cut a top frame rail thickness of 98 thousandths. The steel frames I cut using a .117 cutter took off .118 from the frame rail slot which is not uncommon. With this combination of numbers, we need the frame rails to stick up a minimum of 118 plus 98 thousandths in order to not cut into the dust cover. Our frames are designed to be approximately 219 thousandths tall from the frame rails from the dust cover, which includes a 4 thousandths thick raised lip for the slide to ride on as clearance to prevent the slide from rubbing the dust cover during operation, a key reliability feature. With 219 thousandths total, we can use the matrix rail cutter as is to cut our frame rails to achieve a 0 0.098 thick frame rail thickness and a 0.118 groove while still having 3 thousandths clearance between the dust cover and slide during operation. All checks well here and no need to deck the frame. Now there's the question of shims. The dimensions of a true wide body modular 1911 frame between the top of the slide stop pin and the top of the frame rails is usually in the ballpark of 0 0.340. Our frames are cut to 0 0.346, which includes some clearance between the top of the frame rails and the slide groove. Remember, this clearance is why there is no decking involved. Once this clearance is added back in, the total distance on our frames using the matrix rail cutter with the 0.117 inserts puts us at approximately 0 0.347, which is optimum mid-spec dimension. All of this together means that there is no need to shim the frame or deck the frame. Installing the frame into the car itself is pretty straightforward. Place the frame onto the car rails down and dust cover away from the cutting handle. Install the provided aluminum clamp and torque it down finger snug with the included hex bolt. Don't forget the washer. Do an easy check to make sure the frame is sitting flat before torquing down the bolt with the wrench or ratchet. The car itself is aluminum, so don't go too crazy tightening the steel bolt. Now let's drive the frame back a little to set the distance of the initial cutters. Once the rear of the rails are aligned with the cutters, which were loosened earlier, 
lightly tighten the two adjustment knobs until light contact is made between the cutting inserts and the frame rail. Once extremely light contact is made, advance the car forward so the cutting inserts are clear of the frame. It is important to use the high quality cutting grease on the cutters, which is included, and after tightening the Allen keys down, make sure to apply a generous amount of grease to the cutting inserts. Once your cutters have been zeroed and the car located ahead of the cutters, index the knobs about a quarter turn and tighten the Allen keys. Note that each full rotation of the knob results in 12 and a half thousandths of cutter advancement. In total, you will need to turn the knob about five full turns on each side to reach your full depth of cut. I recommend cutting using a quarter turn increments using plenty of grease. Of course, you will want to use a sturdy surface to mount the car to, such as a vise. For the purpose of this video, I'm only doing a desktop demonstration. After each pass, you can measure the results of your cut by measuring the groove of the frame while still attached to the car. You'll develop a feel for how much material is removed for each quarter turn, which is a little over three thousandths. Again, in total, you'll need about five full turns of the knots. After making a full cutting pass, we need to retract the cutters a bit in order to advance the frame for our next cut. Loosen the Allen screws, back off the advancement knobs about one half turn, advance the frame for the next cut, and at this time I usually wipe down the cutters with a q-tip and apply more grease to clear the chips from the cutter. Rotate the cutter knobs three quarters of a turn to increment the cutter a quarter turn ahead of our previous cut, and finally tighten the Allen screws. You should now be ready to make another cut. At a quarter turn increments and with five full rotations of the knobs, you're looking at a ballpark of about 20 cuts. A 3 8 inch driver, a drill, and a bench vise makes this go by quickly. Now, let's move on to the hole drilling fixture. Grab the two halves and notice on one of the three main screw holes there is engraving for 2011 spacer. This spacer is used to keep the fixture square when tightening the bottommost Allen screw. Install the frame and aluminum spacer into one side of the fixture and then lay the other side on top. At this time I like to take an Allen screw and drop it into the hole that has a spacer, just so it doesn't slip out. Take your two steel alignment pins, the larger for the slide stop pin hole and the smaller for the grip safety hole, and insert them through both sides of the fixture and through the frame. This ensures the steel hold guides in the frame will be perfectly lined up for drilling the hammer and sear pin holes. Drop the remaining two Allen screws in and use the provided Allen key to tighten them. Note that there is an order on which screws to tighten first. This order is engraved onto the fixture. Also included are the proper drill bits for the hammer and sear pin. These fit nicely inside of the steel bushings to ensure you can't wander the drill around in the hole and will get accurately placed holes. Drilling the holes themselves is best left to a drill press. Use some oil to keep things cool when drilling. You should clamp the assembly to the drill press to keep it from spinning, and not use your hands like I did. Once your holes are drilled, you should countersink them on the left hand side so the hammer and sear pin sit flat. I use a simple handheld pin vise and a quarter inch chamfer tool for the hammer pin. For putting a nice chamfer on the sear pin, I find using the hammer pin drill works perfectly fine. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching my video. If you liked it and want to see more, please give it a thumbs up down below and hit the subscribe button. Also, you can visit our website at l10machine.com and follow us on Instagram at l10machine.